Great Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come on this Lord's day, that we can worship you, that we can learn from your word, sing praises to you, and commune with you and with one another. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we have uh, events that are taking place. We have a marriage tomorrow. Uh, we have events in our congregation continue to open up, and Lord, we pray that your hand would be upon these events, that it would all be done in accordance with your will. Lord, we have many people celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. We pray that they would have joy uh, in their life from those milestones and the celebration. And Lord, we lift up before you those that we've mentioned this morning uh, from our prayer list, uh, Bob McDeal, Ruth Patterson. Joyce Stewart, for the situations in our schools with teachers and students and the situations with COVID, the troubles uh, that Mission Upreach deals with in Honduras because of COVID, and we pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon those things. Pray for Dan Bennett, Lord, that you would touch him. Lord, we lift all these things up before you. And we know that you are an awesome God. We know that you are sovereign. Thank you uh, for your love. We thank you for giving your son, Jesus Christ, for us, for our sins. And Lord, let us rejoice in that. And we pray that our worship to you today would be pleasing and acceptable. And it's in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. <laughs>
Oh. Uh-huh. 
song we just sang talks about a common, a lot of common things that we have. And if you think about in our audience, we've got people from all different walks of life, all different backgrounds. Um, and really, when you think about it, there's a lot of things we don't have in common. But the one thing that we do have in common is that we can come here each Sunday and commune with our Lord, our Creator, the one who died for us, and, and we can have that common bond together to where we can uh, worship him and thank him for, for what he's done for us. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we can commune with you, that we can remember the pain and suffering that Jesus went through as he put on that earthly body, knowing the punishment that he was going to go through, and, and yet he did that for us so that we could be in heaven with you, and we thank you for that. We thank you for this bread that we're about to partake of that helps us to remember the, the body that uh, he sacrificed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. They tried my Lord as master with no one to Who need, to all who need a, a Savior. Savior. 
This is the night in which Jesus is portrayed or betrayed. This is the night when Judas will will turn him in, hand him over to the authorities. This is the same night where he institutes the Lord's Supper. This is the night, you know, he talks about servanthood, where he takes out the towel and washes the disciples' feet. It is this night when all of this is going on, and then he gives us a glimpse of the unseen world where Satan is addressing God and is asking for Peter. And in the original language, the word ask is too weak, because what it literally means, he is strongly demanding, he is insistently demanding to have you. See, all the others, he said, are going to fall away, but then he brings up, you know, there is a devil that wants you. Now, you know, the first question I would ask when Jesus said that, what's he want to do with me? What does the devil want me for? But Peter, you see, is so confident, so certain, so assured that there is nothing that can stand between him and God and with Jesus. So he almost just overlooks it. And I want you to understand this. If the Lord said to me, this night, the devil desires you. I'm staying up all day. I'm not going to sleep. I'm making sure I'm praying all day long. How about you? I mean, it's kind of spooky, isn't it? I mean, if the Lord said the devil's coming tonight and he wants you and he desires you, and then he says this to Peter, he's going to sift you like wheat. Now, that doesn't bring the, 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 the danger to us because we're not farmers. We don't sift wheat. In fact, we got tractors to do it. But what he's really saying is I'm, he's going to knock the tar out of you. He's going to tear you apart just like in the old days they take, they would thrash you at threshing wheat with it. I was going to bring my dog dog. I mean, old Rosie, my dog just grabbed that thing, runs all over the house with it, and I was going to take it and pound it back and forth because what it means is you're going to be violently shaken and you're going to be separated just like the wheat is from the shaft. And so he, the husk that around the corn. And what he's saying is, you're going to go through something very brutal, something very difficult. And the purpose is this. Watch it here now. The purpose of sifting the wheat. I hope I don't lose my voice, Dan. <laughs> the, very, the very purpose of the devil, you know, sifting the wheat is to separate you from God. That's what you do when you... Sift wheat. You separate the chaff from the grain. And so the idea is he is coming to tear you apart. Think about this. Forget that image for a moment because it doesn't give us the image that I want us to get. Think about putting your hand down through a garbage disposer. Who would do that? And cutting your fingers off and your fingers are separated, you see, from your hand. And it would be an agonizing and painful experience. Would you agree with that? What he's saying to Peter is you're going to go through a, a brutal Tom Will. Is that what, what's wrong there? Yeah. God rocks. <laughs> well, thank you. There's one good man here. <laughs> you're going to go through something else. You say, why does the Satan want to do that to Peter? I don't know. I don't know why some of you have gone through some ordeals. There's sort of a mystery in the text because God grants to the devil the permission to sift him like wheat. Why does God allow that to happen? Why is it that some go through life and go through all kind of agonizing and terrible experiences and others sort of just slide through life? There's a mystery there. Why does God grant the permission for people to suffer to go through terrible experiences? But one thing is for certain. 
that he cannot touch anybody, that is the devil cannot touch anybody without God's permission. Are you with me? You cannot go through anything that the devil does unless God allows that to happen. Now, notice this. Boy, after all of that, I'm telling you what that would be. At least for me, pretty spooky. I'd be trying to hide out somewhere. How about this? You'd find me in church all day. But if the devil can get into that circle, he certainly can get into the church, can he? But I prayed for you. Let me give you what the force of the grammar is. I prayed, it's like an error's tense, which means I prayed, I sledgehammered that prayer in one time, I didn't repeat the prayer, I prayed to God, and if I prayed one time and the matter is settled, I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. And what is he saying? I want you to understand something here. I'm not interested in preaching, I just want you to understand some things. You can go through things, and if you're not careful and you don't anchor yourself in God, you can lose your faith. And some have. What he's saying is, I pray that your faith would not utterly, completely fail. And I'm praying that you don't lose your faith. What you're going to go through, others have lost their faith. They've lost their faith on things that are not even as difficult. Oh, and for some people, it has to be just something almost incidental. It doesn't even have to be some catastrophic event. They lost their faith almost on nothing. And so Jesus said, I pray that when you are sifted, when he tears you to pieces, when he's done with you, that you do not lose your faith and your faith is gone. That's what happened to Judas. You see, when Judas portrayed Jesus, he lost all hope. He does not seek forgiveness. Perhaps he doesn't believe God can forgive him. He's all by himself. And that's why it ended tragically. You see, you can go through some things where you no longer can face it. You no longer know how to deal with it. And I, I've been in my, in my lifetime of preaching for over four decades. I've met people that believe that God no longer loves them. They think they've done some horrible thing. They don't think that God can forgive them. And what I'm trying to say to you is that what he's saying to Peter is when you've gone through all of this, and you have denied me, and you have disowned me, and when it looks utterly hopeless, and you couldn't believe that you could ever do it. I prayed for you, and Peter was able to come back to God. Oh, I wish I could talk more than that. Now, I want you to see something very important here, too. But I pray for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned, strengthen the brethren. Now I want to say this. Satan is just not after Peter. He's after them all. You get that from Matthew chapter 26. He's just not interested in Peter losing his faith. He wants everybody to lose it. He, he, he's been on spiritual genocide. He wants all mankind to be lost. He wants every member in the church for their faith to fail. I have some concern and I have some fears that because of this thing that we're going through and it's lasted so long, 
that some will lose their faith. Their faith will fail them. Do you understand, brethren, he's not just after the person in the back pew or the person in the front pew or the person behind the pulpit. He is interested in every member of the church being lost. I wish we could get people to believe that, don't you? That Jesus brings in the story, not just the temple police, not Caiaphas, the high priest, but he brings in the devil who wants mankind to live all. And yet, you see, God wants all mankind to be saved. The grace that has appeared has appeared unto all men, Titus 2 and 11. God is not willing that any should perish. Do you understand God wants everybody sitting here out on the street, down in the neighborhood? He wants every man, he desires for every man to be saved. And the devil, he is so evil and malignant that he wants everybody to be lost. You say, why? Because he hates God and he hates everything that God loves. Now, it, it's rather remarkable to me that Peter doesn't believe him. Just like sometimes when people hear the word of God, they don't believe it. Though Jesus warns him and sternly warns him, he does not take the warning seriously. And I want you to understand that the devil just doesn't wander around aimlessly. Peter said, and he, he knows a lot about the devil when he wrote this, that the devil, our adversary, is like a roaring lion, you know, walking about seeking who may, may devour. Paul talks about the wiles of the devil, the methods of the devil. In other words, the devil has a tactic. He has a strategy. And the strategy oftentimes is to look at your weakness, the weakness that you already have. Do you all know we have weakness? David's weakness was the lust of women that brought all kind of trouble in his life because of a woman by the name of Bathsheba. Judah's weakness, like other men, other men, was covetousness. He loved money. He was greedy. And the devil used the lust to get to David. He used the greed to get to Judas. And he used... Peter's overconfidence to get to Peter. What is your weakness? What is your weakness? Because he'll use the weakness that you already possess to get to you. So on that night after Jesus is taken by the temple police, we are moved into a courtyard scene of the high priest. And I want us to look for just a moment, if you will, in the Luke chapter 22. I believe I want to stay there. And just look at this very briefly, then I'll let you go. Verse number 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed from a distance. Now, looking at the text, I have to think for a moment that Peter has some kind of courage to go into the lion's den. He's following at a distance, and perhaps he thinks he's safe like so many. You know, there's a whole lot of folks that will follow Jesus at a distance. They don't want to be committed. 
They don't want to be known as a Christian. They don't want to be really involved. They may believe in God. They might believe that Jesus is the Christ, but they're following at a distance if they're following at all. And a lot of times people who are following at, or rather following at a distance think they're safe and they're not safe. It's amazing to me. I used to watch football all the time. And now I can care less about it. I don't know about some of you. I mean, I, no, that was before they you know, knew what they're doing today. But I used to watch football. Marsha could tell you. I get excited about it. I hate to see the Steelers lose. Love to see the Browns lose. <coughs> yeah, I got your way now. And, and, and I don't care about it at all. But the thing that used to get me, I used to hate to see it. I used to, I mean, I could never understand when the defense played it safe because it was never safe. How many know what I'm talking about? Prevent defense. There you go. And it never prevented anything. They always would score. You see, what I'm trying to say is when you play it safe, sometimes you're in real danger. But we think when we're playing it safe, we're safe. And so he's following at a distance. Now, when they had kindled a fire, remember it's in the darkness of night. I wish we could talk about where Jesus said about the devil in the text, this is your hour and this is the power of darkness. The, the devil is using the darkness, but I, we're not going to talk about it. But anyhow, they kindled the fire in the midst of the courtyard, and he sat down, literally he sat down for a while. I don't know how long he was sitting there. I don't know once they started the fire, he got a little bit nervous, because you get a fire going at night, you can see the guy on the other side. So, so they started a fire, and he sat down, and Peter sat among them for a while. Then in verse number 55, or rather uh, 56, and a certain girl. Now what's interesting to me is this. If I've been sitting by the fire, and one of the guards, or one of the soldiers, or one of the police were to talk to me and start questioning me, I'd probably get a little intimidated. But it's interesting, remember that the devil's behind this and he uses a girl and a young girl because I think that Peter's going to get entrapped not even being aware of it. <laughs> Doesn't that happen? Have you ever said to yourself, I wonder how I even got into this? I, I really don't even know how it happened. I mean... I wasn't planning it, I wasn't intending it, and all of a sudden I found I got myself in a mess. Anybody here do that? So Satan uses a young girl. Sometimes he'll use a close friend. Sometimes he may even use a member of your own family. In other words, these are people that you do not expect to give you a whole lot of trouble. So here's this young girl in verse number 56, and she looks at him, the Bible says, intently. In other words, across that flickering fire, there's this young girl staring at him. I don't know about you. <laughs> I had an interesting thing happen when I was in old town. Uh, my granddaughter was acting up, so I just give her that, you know, Darth Vader stare. <laughs> when she wasn't acting right. And you know what? She says, quit looking at me. <laughs> I mean, isn't it weird when somebody stares at you? I mean, intently. I, 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 you'd probably get nervous if I was just looking at one of you this morning. If I started talking about, you know, some people need to repent and I was just looking at you. <laughs> Would you get a little nervous? I've, sometimes people after a sermon will say to me, why were you looking at me all through the sermon? And I wasn't even looking at you. Yeah. That's happened. Why 
were you talking about me? I didn't even know you were here until later. <laughs> it's amazing sometimes. This man was also with him, she said. But he denied him, saying, here's a good strategy to get yourself in trouble. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Just pretend you, you're ignorant. Woman, I, I do not know. Listen, that's amazing. He's been with him for day in and day out for nearly almost four years. Been with him everywhere. Left everything to follow him. Can you imagine yourself... Uh, when somebody asks you about some scoundrel that you might know that is your friend or was your friend, and you say, "Well, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't really know," you've been lying. You mean after all that moral teaching, after all the things he'd heard, that now he stoops to lying and he says to someone he has known intimately. I don't know. And then a little bit later in verse number 58 another saw him and said you are with him. Now when you read the other text there's some time interval and what you'll see in, that, in Matthew and Mark is that Peter is starting to feel the pressure after the first Denial, and now he slipped out of the courtyard into the outer courtyard because he wants to get out of there. I mean, that fire is getting too hot. And so here he's slipping out so no one notices him. But remember, Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times and no matter where you hide or where you, what corner you're in, I don't care if you get in the basement or the attic. If Jesus said this is going to happen, it's going to happen no matter how slippery you get. That's why I started the sermon by saying and emphasizing the scriptures must be fulfilled. Whatever Jesus says it's going to happen, that's the emphasis of the Bible. And so he thinks, you see, by slipping out of the open courtyard into the outer courtyard, and we're going to see in just a moment, he heads down to the gate, out to the street, because he really wants to get out of there. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. The scriptures must be fulfilled. I want you to have that kind of confirmed faith of the Bible. And then a little while longer, she says, you are one of them. Now, in this verse, it says, man, I am not. Now, in the second, we won't allude too much to that, but when he denies Jesus the second time, he does it with an oath. That doesn't mean a lot to us, but it would to them people back then. When you made an oath before God, if you didn't keep that oath, you were bringing a curse down upon you. He's even like saying, I'm swearing on the Bible, I don't know him. In this one, when you read the other text, watch it here. I almost wanted to do it, but I know some of you wouldn't like it, and I decided it wouldn't be after the fall. But on the third one, he cusses and swears. You ever notice people, uh, when they want to emphasize something, they'll swear? You ever notice that? They'll use some real foul language. I wouldn't use any foul language to so don't run out and say, oh, you know what he said? He didn't say anything. But now he's so caught up in the moment that he curses. I don't know what the word he used. But now he curses. I have 
no connection with him. I swear by God I don't know him. And then he begins to curse and to swear, to emphasize. I don't have anything to do with it. Can you see what's going on here? And all of a sudden, the rooster drawled back. And began to crawl. And the sound of the rooster caused Peter to remember what Jesus said. This night. You will be denied me three times. The sound of the rooster went far beyond his ears, but it penetrated into the deep recesses of his conscience. Overwhelmed with a deep sense of guilt. It's been my experience with so many, and all of us have failed in different ways, that guilt can be a terrible tyrant that can harm us all of our days. In Shakespeare's Macbeth, when I was in high school, they made us read Shakespeare. Can you believe that? What are they reading now? <laughs> Mickey Mantle was a center fielder. I hardly understood a word that Shakespeare said because, you know, he said that in Elizabethan or Middle English, and who knows that stuff. But in Macbeth, he's so overwhelmed with guilt because he murders the king. He was so ambitious for the power. And after he gets what he wants, he starts killing other people. And then he becomes insanely mad because the guilt, in spite of where he got what he wanted, the guilt became so overwhelming that he became mad and insane. Guilt can do that. And I want to talk to somebody here today who hears the sound of the rooster. If you ever notice sometime, no matter how old we get, that an old song can bring back memories. You can be passing the street and see something in it. Just brings up your memory. And and some of the things that we've done that we felt terribly guilty about, it's almost it's almost like it happened yesterday. Brother Betty, how do you stop the sound of the rooster crawling? Well, the only way I know is the forgiveness of God. Amen. Now, let me make so you get this clear, because when we talk about regret and guilt and all of that, we are not talking about self-pity. God doesn't want your self-pity nor your regret. He doesn't care about that sorrow. He does care about godly sorrow that worketh repentance. 
So he's not talking about you becoming absorbed with yourself about your guilt and your terrible situation and the things that you've stupidly done. He's not talking about that at all. What he's talking about, the kind of thing he wants, is a godly sorrow that will cause you to repent and turn back to God. And God says, I will forgive you. You need to understand that God loves you. And no matter how much you messed up, you don't give up. And so, doing what he thought he would never do, instead of going out, leaving God, and his faith utterly failing. And I'm just saying that because I've seen many. I says the more to every now and then. So many, so many have left God. So many. Just so many. Things interrupt their lives. Things happen. And they live the Lord. I've seen so many over the years. So many. So many. Leave the Lord. And what Jesus was praying, <clears throat> in spite of the fact that you hit the bottom, there's a way back. In 2 Corinthians 2, 11, if you remember, there's a man that did things that even a guy down the street couldn't believe. In fact, Paul will say about the church of Corinth, you know, even the Gentiles, those heathens, would not approve of that sort of stuff. Do y'all remember? Here was a man who was sleeping, the Bible just says, with his mother. We presume it's a stepmother. That would be a little softer. Although Nero did. Nero did. Did you know Nero did? It was so awful that Paul said, not even the Gentiles do that stuff. But he repented. And what Paul says there is, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices or schemes, because here's the point. Doing something like that could end your life. Terrible. We think that's really terrible. It is. But he's been forgiven, and he's warned in the church to accept and forgive him, because we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. You see, the devil wants you to have guilt, regret, self-pity that will cause your faith to disappear completely. Oh, I tried that, and it didn't work. And that was enough. So I want to challenge you today. Uh, I think the text is over there to pull. It's a challenge for each and every one of us. That our faith will be anchored in God, regardless of what happens to us. Amen. Amen. Well, if you're here today, I need to let you go. We end the lessons usually with an invitation. Jesus said, Go in all the world and preach the gospel. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And then the journey begins. We just get started. And then we live out our life for God. And if you're here today, I hope that we said some things that will renew your heart if you need it. And if you need to repent, we hope you do so. It's just a heaven's sake. Oh, heart, bow down with sorrow.
Be. Mm-hmm. 